iHeartRadio Broadway, driven by Mercedes-Benz. The best or nothing. Well, we're coming up to the Tony Awards, and Christina, I think I can safely predict the winner mm-hmm. for uh, the Tony for Best Play this year. It's going to be a remarkable play by Jez Butterworth called The Ferryman, which I saw in the fall when it first opened, still doing very, very well on Broadway. A really very funny, touching, and scary play. Now, you just saw it, and you, I, were, you were knocked out by it. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, Michael, as I told you, I know I'm like nowhere near cool enough to be using this phrase, but I'm going to go for it. Mm-hmm. I am still shook. You're shook. Yes, yes. This is one of the best pieces that I've ever seen on Broadway. This has been, like, the greatest theater experience overall. So well, I have no doubt. We're not going to give away the ending, but I bet you jumped out of your seat at the very end of the play. I may have. You still are. I may have taken still, a little while still, to recover. Still I'm still flying processing. around the rafters up there at the theater. Still well, processing. We yeah. are joined by the star of the play, The Ferryman, an old friend of mine, Brian Darcy James. He joined the uh, cast recently, and Brian has been a fixture on Broadway for a long time, I remember, Brian, your Broadway debut, if I'm not mistaken, The Stoker in the Titanic? Uh, you're, you're off by one what Broadway show, that? Blood Brothers. Blood Brothers? Actually, oh, a couple. I did Blood Brothers, then Carousel, then, then uh, Titanic. Did you do the Nick Heitner Carousel? I did, yeah. Really? Yeah. Original cast? Uh, original, original New York cast. It came over from the National Theater, right. so Michael Hayden, who played Billy Bigelow, and uh, I think... I think Audra may have done it in, in London as well, but uh, yeah, that was uh, that was my second Broadway show. But Blood Brothers, right across the street from where I am now at the Music Box Theater, is where I started. Well, I remember uh, you came to our attention because you had that beautiful song by Maury Yeston. Yes, the Stoker. You were down there in the yep. bowels of the ship just yep. before it hits the iceberg. There are two great songs that that, uh, mm-hmm. that my character got to sing: Barrett's song, which right. was which is Barrett's solo, but then of course the the duet with Martin Moran. Uh, oh, the Night nice. Was Alive, where, where my character proposes uh, over the telegraph, and we both kind of sing our love for, in my case, for my betrothed and, and him for technology. And it's great. great we'll get to the song. ferryman in just a second, though, but Titanic's on my mind because I'm working on a book now, and I interviewed Maury about it. Titanic was one of my favorite musicals of the last 25 years, and it was a show, though, that we all laughed when we heard they were going to do Titanic. I remember the headline in my newspaper, my article, was uh, they sing, they dance, they drown because <laughs> nobody could take a Titanic music seriously. And then I went to your first preview that lasted about seven hours. Yeah, that you was a long you one. You couldn't sink the ship at the end, remember Yeah, that? It technically it was, it was audacious in every way, just st- subject matter, uh, technically the things that they wanted to achieve, and it did take us a while to iron, iron it out. But um, yeah, there, there were a lot of uh, uh, similar um, uh, things being said uh, and, 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 and discussed about, about how, how could this possibly be. And uh, but it was it was all the more sweet when we were able to kind of figure it out and and basically do what what Maury and and Peter Stone and Richard Great Jones, writer. our director, had had envisioned, and we were able to kind of achieve that. So that was pretty amazing. And what was interesting was the expectations were so low because the the buzz and previews had been they can't sink the ship, it goes on forever, it's a disaster, it's a mess. And I went to the opening night, and the opening night audience went in with no expectations, and they were visibly moved. I remember Lauren Bacall sitting next to me burst out crying at the end. Yeah, there was a, a really interesting thing that happened during previews where where we changed the ending so that the the uh, survivors w- w- were kind of uh, be, came back together with the the, the people, people that died, had passed yeah. had perished, and uh, that was an ending that I think was 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 in debate for a long time and and hadn't been utilized and, and staged until late into the previews. And I I distinctly remember, in fact, uh, Don Stevenson, who was also in the cast. I remember Don and I leaving the, the show and thinking, well, that's that may be the final piece of the puzzle to kind of really have that that kind of uh, uh, definitive stamp on the, the emotional stamp on, on what people wanted to experience in that in that show. And uh, I think from then on, we, we, we really found our, our rhythm. And you how wound up it, winning the Tony Award for Best we Musical. Did. We yeah, did. Yeah. I'm wondering how it feels to go on stage where, you know, Michael's saying there was like a negative buzz leading up to this opening night. If it feels like the tides against you, so to speak. Well, you can use it all in your choice and how much you're going to focus on that. Really, at the end of the day, you can just do what you're what you're supposed to do, and uh, you know, forget all the things that are being discussed or said outside of the the theater. Uh, you can't control that. So, um, you know, we knew we had a lot of work to do, but we, we also knew that it was achievable. Mm-hmm. And, it, and every day, the preview process is an interesting one because you can you can really get a sense of how things are shaping up. For the better, and sometimes you know you're kind of spinning your wheels. You uh, you also can sense that, and that wasn't the case in, in uh, with this show. Mm. All well, right, so yeah, this time with the ferryman, you've you've come into a show that's established as 
being a phenomenal show. Were you a fan of it before you stepped into the I world? was. I was. The, the, the precursor to this answer is that I had seen uh, Jez Butterworth's play Jerusalem mm-hmm. in London uh, starring Mark Rylance, who I'd never seen on stage before, I'm embarrassed to say. And that, that changed my life in, in so many ways. Just That performance in that play was so incredibly astounding. Uh, for me as an actor to watch what I was witnessing was uh, just kind of a redefinition of what I wanted to try to be able to achieve. And uh, so then I, I had heard about uh, Jazz's next play, and I saw it in London and was, was astounded. And as mm-hmm. you say, I was shook as well. <laughs> and I was sitting in the very last seat of the theater, so far away, and I was so uh, just, I didn't miss any, any ounce of it. It was, uh, it was incredible. And so when I, I knew that this thing was going to be coming to New York at some point or another, and so I was very vocal about saying, I don't know what or how or if there's any ever chance, ever any a chance to, 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 to throw my hat in the ring, mm. but I would like to just, you know, in case that company can't come over, et cetera, et cetera. They, of course, did come over and were victorious and celebrated and amazing and uh, and got this show off to a, an, an astounding start, and then then a lot of the the cast left in mm-hmm. February. So that was uh, that was this miraculous chance for me to to, to join. How was your uh, Irish accent? Did you uh, have to work on it? So those well, sound I, like lucky charms. Yeah, well, that's always yeah, the, the, the <laughs> that danger. sounds like a tough one. The well, one that no, you guys Northern, were doing. Northern yeah. Irish is, is is specific. You mm-hmm. know, regional accents in Ireland and anywhere are, are important to get if you want to try to be authentic. Uh, and I had I had done a Northern Irish accent a couple of times in a, t- a couple of different plays, one by Mark McDonough, one by uh, mm. uh, Kenneth Branagh, of all things. Uh, so I, I I had worked on it and I felt comfortable with it. I'm no expert by any means, but um, so I, I I didn't feel I didn't feel overwhelmed by that particular technical challenge of it. I felt pretty comfortable with it. Um, but you know, it's it's um it, it is a lot to consider because you you want to have the sound of of the ge- geographical sound of Northern Ireland, and you want that to be right. This show, um, it takes a little while, it, and tell me if this was your experience when you first saw it. There's a lot of people living in that farmhouse, right? Yes. So is it deliberate, do you think, on the part of the playwright that it takes some time for us to put it together, what the relationships are, who belongs to who, so to speak? Absolutely. I th- I, I've read a lot about what Jez has, has done in terms of crafting this play and, and thwarting expectations and setting up relationships, particularly between between Quinn and Caitlin, mm. uh, who you see at the very beginning of the play, other than the prologue or the, 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 start, of the start of the play, which kind of sets up the political ramifications. Then you get into the heart of the play with, with the cottage being revealed. And and so, yes, I think it's very deliberate to to put put the audience uh make them believe they're seeing one thing and yes. then slowly but surely realize wait a second i'm not i'm not exactly sure where the ground is here and uh which is a great kind of way to to set up the whole show and in, in in terms of all of the themes that are clashing uh mm-hmm. against each other and providing this 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 cauldron of of uh, uncertainty and and longing and menace. and, and yes, menace yes there's such a uh, building you yeah, know? there's there's a great there's mm-hmm. a great pot boiler aspect mm-hmm. to this play, which is which is I think really what's keep people you know, on the edge of their seats. And so, along with that, you have this this great love story, and you've got this great family story with these incredibly drawn characters, with these extraordinary children who are, are incredible actors, but also playing these these very rich and distinct characters. So there's there's so many so many things bouncing off each other, and it's so vibrant and alive and and funny and. Uh, there's just really, it's such a combustible experience. And let's cottage. not forget the live animals. There's You've got right. a goose and a rabbit. A goose and a rabbit. Yeah. <laughs> goose and a rabbit. And do they the, get bigger billing than you do? And the world's uh, calmest. I haven't checked. Yeah. <laughs> they got I'm a better dressing to. room. I'm afraid to. <laughs> the world's calmest baby. We were wondering, like, are, are there several babies back there backstage? There's 26 that, babies <laughs> yeah, backstage. Yeah, we thought so. That's it. I knew that was the secret. <laughs> the political <laughs> dynamic of this play is interesting, though. For people who haven't seen it, we should let them know that uh, in the uh, in the early 80s in Northern Ireland, uh, people who ratted on the IRA or who turned on the IRA would often disappear. And this play begins, and in the past, uh, a man had disappeared. But as this play shows, you really can never bury the past because his body has been found. And that sets in motion who did what to whom in this play. Correct. That, that was a very diabolical element of the troubles wherein, as you say, uh, the disappearance of people or the disappearing of people uh, as a political uh, act of vengeance was, was, was brutal because 
um, as my character says, it keeps the wound open. It gives mm -hmm. people hope, and it just it just prolongs uh, the the pain of having lost someone. And it's 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 really not a loss actually at all because there's this this idea that perhaps that person is still alive because the the devious aspect of it is that people that are trying to prop this this idea up are telling the the the, the people that have uh, are still are survivors of the disappeared they're saying oh well we saw him we just saw him on a, on a, a ferry to Liverpool we saw him in, in you know playing the horses and so there's always this idea that oh my loved one is still alive and yet somehow you know deep inside both things are true that he's gone and he's you know but you you always want to cling to hope so that is a very um a very specifically uh, a sharp and awful thing that happened, and that, that really is the heart of what's going on with uh, with Seamus uh, right. Carney, who happens to be my brother and is also the the husband to Caitlin Carney, who is now a, a widow and living in our cottage. And you know what happened to your brother, but you can't speak openly about it because it could happen to you because the IRA is still very big presence in this play. That's correct. They they the, the chickens come home to roost in a sense because they want to clean it, clean this up. Now that Seamus has been discovered, they want to make sure that that uh, there, there are no wrongful allegations. They want to keep their hands clean with this. And by virtue of my past and association with the IRA, they feel like they, can, they, ha they might have a willing participant to, to, uh, to join in on this, this lie. So, um, and that's where the drama occurs because Quinn Carney is, is, is opposed to it vehemently because he wants to protect his family. He wants to live in the truth. Uh, and he, does, he doesn't want to besmirch the legacy of his brother by, by basically selling him down the river. Um, and of course, uh, you know, the, the role of Caitlin, played by Holly Fain, is, is in this position where she has to, you know, figure out how, how, she's, how she has to live with this loss. And, you know, we're all aware of the, of the association, the IRA associations with Seamus and also for Quinn. Um, but in this household, there's, there's this attempt to turn the page and move forward and try to get past this. And, and part of the drama is that perhaps we can't. And this is so, it's so multi-layered. There's no way, you know, people are like, what's the show about? I can't sum it up for you. And well, you can't give away all the twists and turns of the plot. And we too. don't want to do any of that. Of course, I want it to unfold and be discovered, you know, in the same experience that I had. But for, for you as an actor, do you feel like it's a, the kind of character where you're finding something new every single performance? Yes. The answer is yes to that. Because of the writing and because of this majestic construction it's like a cathedral this this play and and there are so many you know there's so much filigree and so so many ornaments that hang from each bough of this tree i just mixed mixed my metaphors <laughs> but um it it really is a every chance you do it the the the, the material is so rich but I, i've thought a lot about this and and in in terms of what what i what i respond to i think at the end of the day it's really about the beating heart and how the heart longs for the, the thing that it does naturally wants to love and it mm -hmm. wants to extend itself and it wants to envelop and blanket you know everyone with with its natural inclination its job to love and there are many ways where that heart and that love can be bound by by regret by misgivings by family uh, problems and then you reach out beyond that you have political uh, social injustice, um, all the things that are kind of barbed wire around that fence that are trying to stop it from doing its job. I think that's what makes this place so beautiful is that the heart just wants to be as potent and alive as it can be. And there are a lot of things that are pressing against it. Uh, and and uh, there, there's the drama right there. Who is going to win? Will the heart survive? Now, you jump back and forth between, yeah. Uh, yeah, between musicals and straight plays. When you were beginning as an actor, did you start out as a musical theater actor, or did you want to be a Shakespearean actor? Well, I, I studied acting in, at Northwestern University, and I always sang. So, so acting or so musicals were the thing that I could do. Uh, I, I were kind of my bread and butter. I, I felt really confident singing, and and I, I, it was just something that was a muscle that built up fairly early on in my in my college career, and even just when I started, it was just that's how I began. Uh, but when I learned how to act, when I studied acting, I, 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 you know, I realized that it was there were different colors on the color wheel, and I, I always wanted to be able to do as much as I could. And uh, when I got to New York, you know, you, you have to you have to put your best foot forward. So musicals were the thing that got me. There's going. more work. Yeah, there's just you know you need a job. Yeah. So um, you know, as we were just talking right before we went on air, my first job was a was a summer stock production of Annie Get Your Gun, mm -hmm. and I was elated to to, <laughs> to do it. 
And then right after that, I did a play called Lend Me a Tenor. And so I was quite early on, I was very aware of trying to kind of keep the balance of those two things going. It's very easy when you're starting off to be pigeonholed as something. Oh, that's the singing guy. Yeah, or, right. or that's the Shakespeare guy or that's the so and so. Um, so I was I always tried very hard to to uh, to, to keep that balance uh, th- at the beginning and, and still now. And going forward, would you still like to jump uh, back and forth or is it just more satisfying to be in something as rich, let's say, as the ferryman as opposed to, I don't know, a big rubber suit and Shrek? Right. Well, both have their 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 merits and challenges and uh, value, um, y- you know, Doing Shrek was was uh, you know it's it's a left turn for sure and it's it's um it's it's was a unique and incredible experience, um so the answer is I think yeah I would love to be able to kind of zig and zag as 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 many times as I can, um but I will say the ferryman is 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 something that I think is w- will remain you know as probably one of the most satisfying challenging and remarkable experiences I've ever had as a professional actor, I, I don't think it gets any better than Well, this. plays like that don't come along very often. They anyway. really don't. And then to be in it with, with 21 other extraordinary people delivering this thing that you know is creating an environment where people are watching it and are just leaving gobsmacked. Mm-hmm. That is, that is um, once in a lifetime. Yeah, definitely. Before we let you go, we'd like to ask our guests uh, for maybe three songs from the musical theater that uh, have a special meaning to you in your life. Um, well, let's see. When I was growing up, my, my parents were, were big fans of, of Broadway, so we would listen to uh, we would listen to Broadway musicals on the eight track. Yeah, uh, <laughs> sure. some listeners will have no idea what I'm talking about, but uh, <laughs> uh, w- a chorus line was was always always on the uh, always on the uh, in the eight track. Of course, whenever uh, tits and ass would come on, my my, my mother would <laughs> cl- click the things. I never knew that a sign ever existed on that score. <laughs> can I say that on iHeartRadio? You can. Oh, yes, we can. just did. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But anyway, that, from that album, from that cast recording, uh, I remember, I remember really loving um, "I Can Do That." Mm-hmm. I I was so so kind of intrigued by that song because I think at that time I was thinking, well, I, I'm kind of, I've I've done a few things here. It's like eighth or ninth grade, and I, mm-hmm. I you know like why can't I do that? Mm-hmm. And, and it's very similar to my sister as well because my sister is a couple of years older, and she was she kind of paved the way for me being in the theater. So that that's a bit of a maybe maybe a semi autobiographical song which I love. Mm-hmm. Um, Another song that comes to mind is um, is from Floyd Collins uh, by Adam Gettle. It is the uh, I'm going to screw up the the uh, the name, but it's the duet between Floyd and Homer. Um, it's this it's, it's this incredible brotherly love song where where Homer's trying to uh, you know, kind of calm his brother who's stuck in a cave. And oh, forgive me for not knowing the title. Um, I don't remember it either. Oh, but it's 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 one of the most gorgeous melodies uh, that that I've ever heard, and it's it's so touching and so great. And that was a show that I did early on in, yep. in my my time and in New York. Playwrights Horizons. Right? Congrats, exactly, by exactly. the way, you managed to um, stump Michael Riedel, oh and that never God. happens. I, okay. Well, I, I, I've got to, I've got to think of it before I leave. Um, let's see the third song. What's it? What's a good third song? Um, Oh boy, I'm stumped. I'm stumped. I'm gonna just have to give you two and just have th- the third be a mystery box. Oh, <laughs> well, let's see. You could. Uh, what was the very first musical you ever saw? It's Daybreak. Daybreak. This right. just in. Daybreak. Yay. Not the yeah. Barry Manilow Daybreak. No, no. Which I also <laughs> applaud. I like that one too. What was the very first musical you ever saw? Dream Girls. Well, well, broad, Broadway musical was Dream, was Dream Girls. Girls. Yeah, the original cast. The original cast. Yeah. I, well, I, and I'm telling you, I'm not going. That's a pretty good song. Oh my God, I, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I, we, we were, my, we would visit my my uh, aunt and uncle who lived in Connecticut, and and uh, when we would do that, they would bring us into the city and we would see shows, and 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 uh, that was the first one we saw, uh, that I saw with them, and um, yeah, right at the Imperial, right across the street again on 45th Street. Um, but let's see. The first musical I saw probably was something in you know when. Uh, well, I remember seeing Annie in Detroit, going down to see Annie, the touring company of Annie. Um, you, again, in the realm of like big Broadway style mm-hmm. stuff. Um, yeah, so that that's kind of where where my my uh, my Broadway book begins. My favorite song from Annie is Maybe, the very quiet song that opens the show. I love that song. Interesting yeah. way to open a show because usually they open a show with a big brassy kind of a number. Is that, that how it opens? Yeah, that's the first song of the show. I don't Just a little, little orphan Annie singing to with Sandy the dog. Wow. About the parents maybe still alive. That's right. Yeah. Interesting. All right, well, Brian Darcy James is in The Ferryman on Broadway right now. It's nominated for the Tony Award for Best Play. It's an absolutely terrific play. Don't miss 
The Ferryman. What theater are you at again? We're at the Jacobs Theater on 45th Street. Bernard B. Jacobs Theater. Yeah, yeah. thank you for just a great show. Beautiful, beautiful performance. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Really thank amazing. You. Thank you. So this is Inside Broadway. Please follow us if you're listening on the iHeartRadio app or on your computer. Just hit follow so you always know when we put up a new episode, which we do every Friday. Thanks, Michael. We'll see you next time on Inside Broadway.